are at week four. Yes, we, <laughs> we've uh, begun week four, and tonight we're going to have uh, lecture seven and lecture eight. I'm changing the syllabus just slightly. I will put it on the WebCT as soon as I can access it. And uh, <laughs> we were talking before class here with the students in class about uh, the fact that I could not access the WebCT tonight in order to put the notes, the class notes for tonight on there. Um, the site might be down temporarily, is what my guess is. Uh, so I'll put those on tomorrow. I'll be I'll be in on campus tomorrow, so I'll do that. Um, uh, there were some questions about the WebCT and whether it's important for you to get on it. And the answer is yes, you really need to access the WebCT. For one thing, the midterm is going to be on it. So the midterm will be on the WebCT. Uh, we'll post the midterm and we don't know exactly what form it's going to take because of course you have a term paper due at about the time of the midterm. And so um, that really is going to have a lot more to do with your essay question. And I'm kind of inclined to do some short essays, maybe for the midterm, some short essays and, and possibly some map questions I might do. Uh, but, but I'll let you know when we get closer to that. It's really only about a month away uh, to the midterm. Um, so to access the WebCT, I think it's www.uh.webct slash forward slash WebCT. And then you log on and your, usually your password is your birth date. It would be um, two digit month, two digit day, and four digit year. And then once you get on, you can change your password to something else, okay? Um, so uh, basically, are there any questions about that? Are there any questions about the, the WebCT? The big advantage to getting on it is we've got links to other sites is the first advantage. And the second advantage is uh, that I'm putting notes for the lectures on it. So that basically what I'm showing you here, uh, I have uh, printed out on the website and, and of course, since this is my research area, I'll be saying a lot more than I'll actually have printed. So you'll need to, you'll need to get more uh, on it. But if you're missing dates or anything of that sort, you can recheck them with the notes on the WebCT. We also have links to some other sites. Um, okay, about the books. I got in touch with the bookstore again today and asked them why we haven't got our books yet. And so they are trying to check on it and they're doing as much as they can. I actually sort of raised a fuss with them. Yeah, uh, press your mic there, yeah. They said the publisher uh, was out of William the Conqueror <coughs> as I went to Rothers and they called the publisher and they said they were out. Mm -hmm. But I've got it coming off Amazon, so. Okay, okay, that's what I've advised you at this point. Go on to Amazon.com or go on to some of the other bookstores. Try the used bookstores and see if you can get hold of them. You don't have to have the new edition. The old one will do. All right, the other book that we have to worry about is this one by Elizabeth Van Hoots, The Normans in Europe. And this is a collection of sources, and I was looking at this as our, as our textbook. The latest news I've heard on this is the bookstore originally got 25 copies. They have now sold them, and they can't get any more. Okay, so that's the bad news. All right, again, my, I've used this uh, several years in a row here in Houston. So there must be used copies floating around Houston, and I would try the internet for used copies. If you can't get it, don't worry. Uh, we'll just do library research, and you will, you will save your money on those. Uh, luckily, uh, in the past 10 years, almost all the major works on the Normans have been retranslated and their new editions are available <clears throat> and we have most of them in our library. Uh, the library at Rice University has everything, virtually everything. It's a splendid library and you can get a hold of practically anything there that we need for the Middle Ages. So what we'll do if we can't, for those of you who can't get a hold of this, is to make it more of a research paper. And if you, if you just can't get this book, then I'll try to, 
I'll try to use it more and read more from it uh, as we go through the lectures because it's a wonderful book and I really love it. Um, I'm really <coughs> unhappy that it's gone out of print. I hope they'll, they'll redo it. All right, so in two different phases, we're going to look at 1066, the year of the conquest, and first we're going to look at the Norman version as shown in the bio tapestry and augmented by many of the other texts that there are about it. Uh, the reason I'm going to give you the Norman version first is because it's pictorial and we can follow the lines of the whole story. And then in the second hour, I want to backtrack and look at the Anglo-Saxon version and the rationale for believing that one. The problem with the Norman conquest is we've got two contradictory <coughs> stories, one from England, one from Normandy. Some facts we can corroborate, others we simply cannot. And I think we really can't know exactly what happened. Although I'm feeling a little more certain as I went over all this material in the past three days, I've, I've changed my opinion and I've, I've come to a, a kind of different conclusion than I had when I started um, just by reviewing it all in one, in one um, glop here, I guess you would say. So, so I'll give you some of my insights, but you all can make up your own mind and I'm going to try to leave time at the end for, for you all to give your, um, your, your opinions and we'll discuss it a little bit. I see that we have three uh, sites um, that, that we have people in. Uh, the one with four of you, that must be Sugarland, right? Fort Bend? Oh, five of you, Fort Bend. Can you hear me? Can you talk? Can you, uh, is Christopher there? My contact? Yes, I see Christopher waving. Okay, Christopher, could you email me? Go ahead and email me the roll sheet because we're taking roll. Now, who is the other person who is there? Uh, is that North Houston? Yes, there you are. Where are you, where are you located? Woodlands. Woodlands, okay. But we can't hear you. <laughs> All right. The other room seems to be empty. I don't see anyone, anyone in, the other, uh, in the other room, but there's someone else at the woodlands so that there's somebody else. Okay, remember that if we can get microphone contact, uh, you all are, are free to ask questions as well as everyone else. All right, let's turn to... Oh, okay, could you all try one more time at the woodlands? Try at the woodlands, can you, can you talk to us? Do you copy? Yes, Come we back. copy. We read you here at Houston Central. <laughs> Good. Excellent. We've got, we've I, got just, I, I had a quick question for you. I showed up right as you were saying, if you can't get a hold of this, then something because, yeah. Oh, all right. What were you talking about? I was talking about the Normans in Europe, which is the book that I have uh, that I have thought of as our textbook, and it appears that it's now out of print. Originally, there were 25 copies in the bookstore; they've all been sold. And so, try to get it online or at used bookshops. If you can't, then treat your paper as more of a research paper. Um, I had originally. Okay, I've got that book. Good for you. But I don't have the. I, I can't get. I can't get the William the Conqueror book. Okay, that is on order again. Uh, again, try through the used uh, online places, um, and we, we hope it's coming in. I called the library again today, and and they're checking on it. They're going to try as as hard as they can to get it for us. So if you can't get these books, if we'll treat it as a research topic. Okay. Go okay, to the so, library. So we can just research in other books about William the Conqueror and that will be sufficient? Yes. Uh huh. And there, there is so much published. There's so much out there. It's a really popular topic. So you won't have any trouble getting books. And I suggested that you go to the library here. You go to the library at Rice University. They have virtually everything. Um, the downtown library in Houston has uh, a lot of books on the Normans and the Vikings. So you shouldn't have any trouble getting books. Excellent. Thank you very much. And you might save some money. 
Okay, uh, um, where are we? K uh, Sugar Land, <coughs> Fort Bend, Fort Bend. We're, we're here if you can hear us. Yes, we can now hear you. Okay, good. Okay, remember that you can ask questions as we go along too. All right, Christopher. We may lose audio again. We've got, we've got a lot of static and harmonic distortion out here. A lot of static, all right. Did you hear that, Don? No, the desktop Okay, we're working on it. All right, we're going to look at the Norman version and we'll look at the Bayou Tapestry because we have lots of pictures. There are a lot of sources on the Norman side. There are so many written sources because the conquest caused such a stir. It was such a heroic event um, all over Europe, not just in England and in Normandy, but, but all over Europe, everybody noticed. And this, this was something that was really catching people's attention. So a lot of people in France wrote about the Norman conquest. A lot of Normans wrote about it, and a lot of Englishmen wrote about it. And so the first set of sources I'm going to go through are the, um, are the French and Norman sources. And the earliest source that I could find, and I sort of went through all of these again, is uh, the Carmen de Hastingai Proelia uh, by Guy Bishop of Am Amiens. And it, this is out in a new edition. This is it, by Guy of Amiens. And it's been, um, it's been revamped and, and rethought, and a new introduction has been written. Uh, Oxford Medieval Text has a lot of these books, and of course England is uh, particularly conscious of, of its own history. This is an epic poem, and it was written before 11 May 1068. So clearly, this is the earliest version. It's almost an eyewitness account written right after the Norman Conquest, which was in 1066, of course. Um, Guy was not exactly a Norman. He was related to Guy of Pontho, and I, uh, Guy Count of Pontho, who was actually um, his uncle, who lived in the, um, the county of Pontho, which is, we'll see it on a map in a moment. <coughs> It's to the northeast of Normandy and very close to England. It's in the area we think of as Frisia. Remember, remember there were a lot of Vikings who settled in Frisia. Guy was related in, in, in his family relations to Eustace of Boulogne, who was the count of the county of Boulogne right next to Pontho. He was related to William the Conqueror and he was related to Edward the Confessor. So he was linked. Uh, through kinship to uh, many of the key actors of this play. He was a very <coughs> distinguished scholar of the Abbey of uh, San Riquier, and he had traveled widely. He had been on a mission to Rome in 1049 and had attended the coronation of King Philip I of France in 1059. <coughs> he actually died in December 1075. And as the earliest account the authors, um, the editors who have edited this, it's a poem uh, about the Battle of Hastings and how the battle went and everything, but the editors believe that it's a fuller, more honest, and more <coughs> reliable account than uh, the Gesta Guilelmi Gil or the Gesta Normanorum Ducum, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And they also say that it's more explicit than the Bio Tapestry, so that if you were to take this book and put it side by side with the Bio Tapestry, you could cross check uh, the various accounts that are given. Um, and since it's the earliest account, only two years have gone by and there hasn't been time for all the embellishment that inevitably uh, came to be done on this story of the conquest of Normandy. So this is a wonderful account and a very early account. Okay. A-M-I-E-N-S, yeah, Amien. All right, and I should have a map to show you where that is. All right, here I've colored it for you. Here is our map of <coughs> Normandy, and my picture is cutting it off. Here is um, the Duchy of Amiens, and here is Pontho, right up here. And just north of that is Boulogne, and so they're right up here in this area that is Frisia, right next to Normandy. 
and in fact, this is where William Longsword was killed in this area, fighting to, to really get control of, of, of that area. The Normans never succeeded in taking over that area. So that's where he was, and so he's right next to um, Normandy. He would be in a very good place to know all about it. William of Poitiers wrote the Guest de Gil Elmi right after that. Uh, William of Poitiers, uh, my, my new computer won't do accents. <laughs> he was a Norman from Preo, uh, born around 1020 and died after 1087. And 1087, of course, is the death date of William the Conqueror. His sister became abbess of, of Saint Leger de Preo. And which had been founded by Roger of Beaumont. And Roger of Beaumont was one of the chief men who was in the entourage of William the Conqueror. He was one of the chief advisors, and he was very prominent in the government of William the Conqueror before and after the conquest. He was the one who was left to take care of the duchy when William went to uh, England to conquer England. So he was left in charge, he and the queen, uh, not the queen, but he and the duchess Matilda were left in charge, and his 16-year-old son, Robert of Beaumont, fought in the Battle of Hastings. So this is a very prominent family with a lot of close ties. And so William of Poitiers then would have been in a position to really know what was going on. William of Poitiers may well have been a vassal of the Beaumonts, and he started out his life as a knight. He wasn't, he wasn't destined for the church. But he started as a knight, and he had the typical education of a young man in Normandy, which is to, to pick, take up arms at the age of seven years old, learn how to ride a horse, and learn how to fight with the arms that he had. But then, as he reached the top of his prime in, in really uh, knighthood and became a very famous knight, then he turned to the church, um, saying that the knightly life was not for him, and so he, be, he began to study at St. Hilary Le Grand in uh, Poitiers in France. And this is interesting with his connection to uh, the Normans and the Norman conquest because the church of St. Hilaire, or St. Hilary, uh, was built largely at the expense of Queen Emma of England. And so she was the major patron of that church where he got his education. So we can expect him to have an affinity to the Normans in many different directions. He then returned to Normandy to become the Archdeacon of Lisieux, which is in the, west, the eastern part of Normandy. And he was an archdeacon under Bishop Hugh, who died in 1077, and also under Bishop Gilbert Mamino, who was the next, archbishop, or next bishop of Lisieux. And uh, William of Poitiers was also a chaplain of Duke William the Bastard, or William the Conqueror. So he had very close ties, and we can expect him to give you a really Norman, a pro-Norman point of view here. He wrote almost immediately after the conquest, bringing the story up to 10. 71, but he left it unfinished at that point. Probably he wrote between 10, 1071 and 1077, and William the Conqueror apparently asked him to expand the story and write more. William of Jumiege is the next person we'll look at, and, and let me show you William of Poitiers. Um, this is the Guest de Guillaume of William of Poitiers. For a long time, this was only available in a French translation or in the original Latin, but this is a fairly new translation that's come out uh, that now you can read in English. And of course, all of these um, Oxford medieval texts that I'm showing you are facing translations with the Latin on one side and the English on the other. And they're, they're done by very good people. The next person we have is um, the Gesta Norman Norman Ducum by William of Jumiege, who was a monk of the Abbey of Jumiege and an eyewitness of some of the events of the reign of Duke Richard III from 1026 to 1027 onward. Um, William of Jumiege was born about the year uh, 1000 
and Orderic interestingly gives his nickname as William Calculus, and and that um, has been interpreted to mean not that he did calculus, but that he <laughs> calculated the sums of their income, of the income of the abbey, and took track of, of what their income was and and uh, uh, and how they spent it. Uh, he was an accountant, a CPA, or something like that, in other words. So that's why he's named William Calculus. He wrote the Gesta Normanorman Ducum over about 20 years, and he started by giving a history of all the Norman Dukes going back to the first Norman Dukes based on an abbreviation of Dudo of Saint Quentin, who we've mentioned before. But Dudo is largely legendary. And the richness of uh, William of Jumiege's uh, Gesta Normanorum <coughs> Ducum is that it's not just about the Dukes, but it's also about all the leading families of Normandy. And so you can go in, and he's just obsessed with family history and who married whom and how many children did they have and who did those children marry and what did they do. And so he was really obsessed with tracing these families. And so this strikes us immediately as something that's distinctively Norman, the sense of kinship and kin relationships that are so important to the Normans. Okay, and here is the Gesta Norman Norman Ducum. It, it <coughs> exists in two modern volumes. This is volume one. And there are interpolations by Orderic Vitalis and Robert of Torigny. Orderic Vitalis wrote a century later, and Robert of Torigny wrote even a century after that. So I find the most trustworthy thing to do is go through it and look to see what William of Jumiege says. Mm -hmm. Um, even though they're translated, they're still considered primary sources? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, I don't expect, I mean, I can't require you all to know Latin, to read them in the original Latin, yeah. And this is in English, available in English? Yes, this is a facing translation. Um, it's all copyrighted, so I can't really show you. I mean, I could... Sh I, and who has done it, right? Yeah, on, on, one, on, on the left page, there'll be the Latin, and on the right page, there'll be the English, and you can, if you know Latin, you can correlate them all. And so they're, they're, uh, it's very nice to have. Uh, OK, OK. 15 seconds don't count on top of rights, all right? Here we go. Here we go. 15 seconds. Start counting. Here's, here's the English, and here's the Latin, OK? So this is about Queen Gerberga here, uh, uh, who Yes, and, and there is Queen Gerberger, who heard her husband, that her husband had been taken prisoner by the king. Okay, so all of these books I'm showing you are done in that way. And so it's, it helps a lot uh, to be able to cross-check it. It helps to be able to read it fast in English and then go check the Latin if you're not sure of something and you wonder what is the original Latin. Yeah. Say Oxford Medieval. Oxford Medieval Texts, yes. Uh -huh. And these are the, here you can see the Oxford Medieval Texts. This is the series that they're all in. All right. Now, by the early 1050s, um, William of Jumiege had, be, had begun revisions of it and probably finished the first version before 1060. But at the request of Duke William, he added an account of the Norman conquest, which he finished early in 1070. So, because he's, if he's writing in 1070, that's only four years after the Norman Conquest. And so he really knew what was going on. And this is almost an eyewitness account. He died in an unknown time after 1070. Yes, question. Jason, are you Jason? No, I'm Robert. Robert, okay, Robert. Oh, uh, why did he be undertake revisions? Uh, w well, because good writers always revise. <laughs> I mean, when, I, when, when scholars write a book, they revise sometimes 10 times. And, and so the more, the more you revise, the more concise it is and the more perfect it is. And so they were taught in the monastery to write in that way. That's a good question, by the way. Yeah. Could it be that some of the Normans didn't like what he'd written and wanted him to rewrite it so that they wouldn't look so bad? 
No, no, he didn't. Um, he was fully pro-Norman. There was no question about that. Do you remember the Abbey of Jumiez that we mentioned when we talked about the Normans? It was one of those reformed abbeys that had been restored, and there was a school there, and so scholars were there, and they had scholarly, uh, uh, scholarly ethics, just like we do now, and uh, rules for how to write. Yeah, question. The one that wrote somewhat critically about the ancestors, the the Viking stage of their history, he somewhat wrote critically. Somewhat, well, all of them did. I mean, all of them denied, especially the churchmen, denied that they were Viking anymore. But when you sort of read between the lines, you see that they are. <laughs> okay. So he died at an unknown time after 1070. Now, and this is the um, initial first letter to uh, uh, the, his history, the history of William of Jumiesh. All right, and it has this, this picture of, of a king uh, receiving a copy of the book, probably King William. Okay, now the bio tapestry. Clearly the bio tapestry is a very important, um, so I'll just have to hold that is a very important record um, and there are about 400 books published about the bio tapestry. They've been written about endlessly and probably no topic in English history has been debated as much as the Norman conquest or as much as the bio tapestry. With written records we can take the words and we can look at the sentences and we can try to interpret what they say but with pictorial evidence it multiplies a hundredfold the different ways that you can interpret what the story says and so it's all you know Know, and it's like your guess is as good as mine. You could know everything about the Normans and you read it, you read the thing like a document and you try to figure out what happened. Uh, the book I use, and as I said, there are 400 <coughs> books published. At the time this book was published, there were 400 books published about the bio tapestry. This is the one I have assigned. And, and since, since we can't get, seem to get hold of our required books, this is an optional book for you. You might want to go ahead and buy this book. I'm pretty sure it's in the bookstore. It's a lovely book, and it's the entire bio tapestry in, um, in, in pictures with a text that has a scholarly argument about where what it means and how do you interpret it. And so you can get the background on all the different interpretations of the bio tapestry, which we can't go through here, but, um, but you can see where he's coming from. And Wolfgang Grape is, a, is a, an extraordinarily gifted art historian who has made an extremely persuasive argument that is quite different from the arguments that have been made in the past about the bio tapestry. And here you can see some of the colors in it that are so beautiful. And of course, we can see um, they, they took their horses with them. This is William the Conqueror's ship that has this great Viking masthead on it, and they took their horses on the ship with them. You know, they're typical Viking ships. Okay, um, he argues that the bio tapestry originated in Bayou itself. It used to be thought, it used to be conjectured that um, it was an English document, that the English had actually embroidered it. But when we say tapestry, it's not a woven tapestry uh, like the tapestries that you're used to um, thinking about, but rather it is embroidery. It's a strip of linen, a very long strip of linen, and the pictures are embroidered. Well, actually, it's about, it's about between two and a half and three feet high. Um, almost, almost three feet and really, really long, and so it's been conjectured that it was made to hang around a hall so, or a palace now and so Wolfgang Grape discusses whether it was made to be put around a hall, a church, the interior of a church or around a palace and he really comes to the conclusion that it's a palace not a, not a church that it was made for. He, are, he discusses at great length whether it's a religious document or not because um, uh, it's called the bio tapestry. Well, it has several different names. It, it has the name in France of the Tapisserie de la Reine, the Queen's Tapestry, uh, Queen Matilda's Tapestry. So it's associated with 
her in France. Traditionally, it's been thought that it was made by Odo, Bishop of Bayou, who was the brother of William the Conqueror, and he made it for his church in Bayou uh, to hang to hang on the church as propaganda and as a as a sort of tribute to himself as the brother of the conqueror, as well as being tribute to the conqueror. Um, there, he believed that it was made in Bayou itself, not in England, as was previously, previously thought, because the Bayou tapestry has marginalia. It has, there's a main scene in the middle, and, and let's sort of go to that in a, in a minute, do we have it? Well, this is the main scene. And then we'll see that in the other pictures, there'll be a border along the top and a border along the bottom that'll be commenting about the events in the main stream of the tapestry. It used to be thought that there were English rebels who were embroidering it and who were then um, commenting on the Normans and these horrible Normans who had attacked them. And, and some of them are quite risque. I mean, they're, they're interesting, risque little pictures in the margins. And so the question is, not only how do we interpret the main story, but how do we interpret the margins as well? And so there's quite a bit more that, that has to be done with it. So it used to be think that English rebels were making snide comments in the margins against the Normans, and that he really debunks. He, he says that's not true at all. His argument is brilliant and persuasive, and he is, he is a student of some of the best historians, best art historians of European medieval art that there are. And what he argues is that what was at stake was auctoritas, the rule of the conquerors, and that the, it's a propaganda document that is meant to extol the greatness and the rightness of the Norman conquest. It's a work of Norman pictorial propaganda commissioned by the conqueror's brother, Bishop Odo. And it's interesting that after the conquest, Bishop Odo, who was a bishop in Normandy, was also made Earl of Kent in, in England, which meant he had a secular role and he was a commander of the army in Kent. And as we'll see, that's a very important um, um, position that he had. Well, it was finished before 1082 when Odo was imprisoned for rebelling against William. Um, so that it's quite an early document and it's almost contemporary as well. Uh, one thing about it that we can notice is it's a piece of cloth that is portable. And it, once you have this long strip of cloth, not only uh, uh, is it more, en more enduring than other forms of art, but it's also portable. You can roll it up and you can take it from place to place. And this is essentially what he was arguing, was that it was a portable, triumphal monument and that the Normans would roll it up and then they would take it to different cities and display it, whether in England or Normandy, and show pictorially the exciting uh, events of the Norman conquest and the rationale behind them all. Yeah, comment. Um, I've heard that during the French Revolution, they took it out of, I guess, wherever it was, the Louvre or, mm -hmm. or where have you, mm -hmm. and they were going to cut it up and use it to decorate the bottoms of their floats in the parade, and they wound up just wrapping it around this one float many, many, many times, as opposed to actually cutting it up. Uh, the story I had heard was that they had wrapped it around a cannon in the in the French Revolution, that they wrapped it around a cannon and they... Um, and that it, it had grease on it and, you know, it was to protect the cannon and that part of the end of it was ripped off, which is true, part of the end of it is ripped off. But it was only saved by a fluke, just a mere fluke that whoever saw it wrapped around this cannon recognized what it was and rescued it. And, and so otherwise it would have been lost forever. Yeah, I'll comment. Are there other examples of this uh, used by other dynasties of this type of propaganda work? Excellent question, yes. Last week, and I meant to dig that picture out, but last week I showed you a tapestry that came from the Oseberg ship in Norway. And there was a tapestry that is very, very reminiscent of the bio tapestry. It has horses in it, it has wagons, it has very many of the same features that we see in the bio tapestry. I'll try to remember to bring it next week again and show it to you again. 
Oseberg, O-S-E, here I'll write that down for you. <clears throat> okay. Oseberg ship burial. It's, it's a ship burial of a queen in, in Norway. Yeah, question. Actually, I have two. Uh, okay. The first is, I don't, I don't know what you mean by propaganda. To me, when you say propaganda, it kind of has the connotation of misleading a public for political gain. And so exactly. I, don't, I don't know if you, well, I don't know if you mean to say that the tapestry was a lie or not. And that, that's the first question. And the second question is, without kind of a, a continuous propaganda machine, I guess is what you would need. How, how effective was the propaganda, given that they're just traveling from town to town, showing them this tapestry and moving on? It was very effective. It was propaganda, first of all. Uh, propaganda doesn't have to be a total lie. In order, most, and, and, and really, most propaganda has a, a germ of truth to it. That's but, right. That's right. Oh, so. pressure mic. <laughs> um, most of it is based with the kernel of truth surrounded by, you know, the rest of it being a lie. That's what makes it so believable. It's like, well, this part is true. Why isn't the rest, you know, why shouldn't the rest be? Sure, it's what we call spin, yeah. and we're hearing a lot of it now from the political campaigns that we're listening to. Yeah, the, the, you, we have the same set of facts, and one, one group gives it this twist, and the other group gives it this other tri twist, and that's exactly what the Normans are doing. Mm -hmm. I guess propaganda is definitely part of selling yourself and, and marketing in terms of political machinery. Yes, absolutely, and that's what the Normans did. And they had to use this. Uh, actually, Judith Brown gave a wonderful paper at the Haskin Society two years ago in which she argued that it was taken around England and displayed to the English to sell them on the conquest, to say, here we are, look how wonderful we are, we've, we've conquered you and now we're going to rule you. <laughs> Hearts and minds, yes, <laughs> and so um, and and so she argued it was taken around England, but equally, I think it was also taken around Normandy, because um, because of course he, they would want the people back home to know of the heroic exploits of conquering England, and of course once the Normans conquered England, England was the richest country in all of Europe, and just tons of wealth poured back into Normandy. Normandy became instantly, uh, instant, instantly nouveau riche <laughs> in, in terms of all the uh, areas of Europe. And so um, it, it made a very big impact on the Normans at home as well as on the English. And so, and so this propaganda would have uses for all of them. And I'm sure that it was very carefully prepared and very carefully used um, for these propagandistic things. Why put it up in the palace in Bayou and make everyone travel to it? You can just roll it up and take it wherever you want to, to display it, just like we do art displays in this country now, from one museum to another. And so this is, this is I think that Wolfgang Grape makes a, quite a persuasive argument that this is what they're doing. Yeah. Are there negative propaganda work that other dynasties or some of the enemies might put out? Yes, and, and that's why we're doing two lectures tonight, one on the Norman version and one on the English version because there will be an English version. Yeah. It also served a <clears throat> purpose similar to the use of stained glass windows, a method of teaching at a time when most people were illiterate. Yes, uh, well, yes and no. I mean, I would argue that a lot of people were literate, especially the ruling class, the Normans. Um, I, I've written an article on that and made an, arg an argument that people have found persuasive that these Normans who went to conquer England were embarking on making their culture literate and that many of these people had gone to school uh, and, and they're not churchmen, they're, they're laymen, they're soldiers who fought in the Battle of Hastings and they could read and write, they were literate. So, but, but then there are still people who are not literate and as a work of art, this work is so lively and so gorgeous, and, and you can see the story with, with, a, with a powerful impact. So it, it would serve the purpose of a movie today, that if, if, um, if one of our candidates for president were to make a movie telling about the story of his life and how, what a wonderful war hero he was, for example, that's the kind of 
purpose it would serve and it is a powerful document it's, it's a multimedia approach i guess yes a multimedia <laughs> approach right <laughs> in the middle ages yeah comment isn't there also an argument that the people of the 11th century weren't quite as media savvy and weren't necessarily as likely to disbelieve it as propaganda as someone from the 21st century would be uh, no the answer is no because um, <laughs> they knew what the truth was it's just the same way you have spin today in politics that you can interpret something in various ways and so there are there you can interpret the same set of facts in different ways yeah um i was going to say for the masses of people for you know the the great majority it's it, it's generally you know uh, same stuff, different ruler. It's you know for them, it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Well, it, it, and that's that opens a, another question altogether about who were the peasants and what was their position and how dumb were they and and and. Um, my conclusion I have reached, and I don't, I, I'm not able to go through the proof of this for you um, adequately in this class, but. My view, after studying this for 20 years, is that um, th we, d we don't have rigid class divisions in Normandy before the conquest. And, and this, is, this is substantiated by the legal code and um, what is her name who wrote that book? Um, um, I'm forgetting right now. Um, but everything was very fluid in Normandy, including class lines. And there was not a big division between the rich and the poor because everybody was relatively poor before the Norman Conquest. It's only after the Norman Conquest that you see the aristocrats rise to a much higher height than the peasants because before the Conquest, they're all relatively equal. They're poor farmers and landowners and you, you can't separate them. I mean, they're just beginning, that aristocracy is just beginning its rise, yeah. And the question ought to be also, we, we talk about masses a lot today, that we, we assume that it is important to talk to the masses all the time. Uh -huh. in, in the 10th century, in the 11th and 12th centuries, was it really that necessary to talk to the masses all the time, or are people talking within the aristocratic lines? That's an interesting question, and the answer to it, I believe, is that in Normandy before the conquest, and possibly in England as well, because of that Viking heritage and, and, and the coal class setup where, where you have these free farmers who are relatively equal, you don't have rigid class systems. And there's a big argument about whether the Normans brought feudalism to England. Um, and um, um, now I'm forgetting his name too. I'm, I'm leaping around all these things, but but there's a book about uh, the social classes in in uh, England, um, lords and thanes in pre-conquest England, in Anglo-Saxon England, um, by Richard um, Abels. Richard Abels wrote that book, and he never comes out and says it. But England is so like Normandy. I mean, if you, if you defined what feudalism was and you read his description, you would say England was feudal. And they're not that different. The, oh, they're, the two major differences between England and Normandy are that Normandy had mounted combat soldiers and castles, and England did not. They fought on foot. They rode horses, but they fought on foot, and they didn't have castles. They had burgs or fortified cities instead of castles, which are fortified in the countryside. Yeah, question. Press. No question. Okay, let's let's charge ahead here. Okay. Um, anyway, um, Wolf. Uh, the bio tapestry shows the story of Norman victory in enthralling detail, and it's a wonderful piece of art. It's so exciting and so dramatic and beautifully rendered. I mean, one looks at it and, and, and just you're just gripped by it. It's an effective instrument of pictorial propaganda, history through Norman eyes. And I wanted to show you this wall painting that came from Normandy um, at the time. It's 11th or 12th century, and 
And the question is why that Wolfgang Grape raises is why didn't they just paint a fresco or a mural on the wall? I mean, if they wanted to show the Norman Conquest, why did they do a tapestry? And so there are two answers to that question, one of which he doesn't give, but one is that it's, it's a Viking tradition to do tapestries, as we saw in the Oseberg ship. The second answer is that if you, if you do it as a tapestry, you can carry it around. You make it transportable so that you can use it as a propaganda machine. They were very skilled at making, at making um, murals. They could have done it as a mural, and they chose not to do, uh, do it. Okay, and so the, the other theme that's in the bio tapestry is it's the history of God acting through men. And this is a theme of the Norman church at the time. And in the bio tapestry, for the first time we really see expressed a sense of national identity for the Normans, a historical self-awareness. So immediately my question to Wolfgang Grape would be, if I met him, I would say, well, is this the moment the Normans became Norman? when they did this great heroic be deed of conquering England and suddenly they became conscious of their own identity. And, and, and that's my inclination to think that's a real possibility to say, this is the moment, they're still kind of Viking and, and, and my teacher, uh, C. Warren Hollister, used to say, well, the Norman Conquest was the last great Viking raid. <laughs> and so, but, but it can be both. Why can't it be both? The last Viking raid and also the moment when the Normans became conscious of their own identity as separate from in the English and from the Vikings as Normans. And here is um, Bishop Robert, who is, uh, here is William, Duke William, and here is Bishop Robert. Uh, uh, Bishop Odo, who is his brother, and um, and this is Robert. I think this is Robert of Montgomery, who is who is portrayed here. And so here they are, the two brothers, uh, the heroes of the bio tapestry. Now we have Orderic Vitalis, who wrote quite a bit later but he wrote a magnificent work of history and this is the ecclesiastical history of Ordric Vitalis. Um, this is volume two. He actually, it, it comes in six modern volumes. It's a huge work and I've described a little bit of it to you before but I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ordric. He was of mixed Norman and English descent. His father was Odalarius of Orléans a priest in the household of Roger of Montgomery. And Roger of Montgomery, of course, was a Norman in Normandy. Orderick's mother was English, and uh, so he's a product of the conquest. And he was born near Shrewsbury in 1075. At the age of 10, Orderick became a monk of the Abbey of saint Evroul in Normandy. And his earliest written work was interpolations into the history of William of Jumiege around 1109. So I showed you this Gesta Normanorum Ducum of William of Jumiege, and Orderic wrote some glosses into it, some comments in it as he copied it. Okay, uh, he began his great work, the ecclesiastical history as the story of Saint Evroul. And he was just gonna do a little local story of Saint Evroul uh, beginning in the first decade of the 12th century. And then as he wrote and he wrote and he wrote and it widened into a history of the whole Norman church and then it widened even more into a history of the Normans in the great wide world. And so he knew what was going on everywhere. He wrote about the First Crusade, and he wrote about what was happening there. He knew everything that was going on. He knew what the Normans were doing in Italy and Sicily, and he knew. Now, if you want, if you all can't find um, the other primary sources, you could read Orderic Vitalis, especially Volume Two and Volume Three, if you wanted to know everything the Normans were doing. Um, and he knew what was going on all over Scandinavia, which is something that really amazes me. He knew what was going on in Germany. He knew what was going on in Flanders. I mean, he just, here he was, this little monk sitting in a monastery. He didn't travel very much, and he found out everything. And the other thing he does that's really quite extraordinary is 
that he traces virtually every person in the Norman aristocracy so that you can go through his index and you can find every single Norman family and who they're married to and who their children were and who their fathers were and where they lived and what they did. And, and it's a massive history of everybody who did anything in Normandy. It, it's very difficult to read because he jumps all over the place and he goes into these, you know, these side stories, these side issues, and then he says, okay, now back to the main topic. So it's, it's kind of hard to read, but it's a wonderful piece of work. Yeah. Do you have archives to work with or would he interview people? Um, Marjorie Chibnall is the translator of Orderic Vitalis, and here it is. You can see my copy is well used. Uh, Marjorie Chibnall translated this, and she is the great expert on Orderic Vitalis. We can track him down in several trips that he made. He went to England. He traveled a bit in Normandy, but, but there are only about five trips that he makes during his life. And um, mostly he talked to people who came to St. of Rule. And, and he also had contact with the family uh, at St. of Rule, which um, sent a lot of people to Italy and had people that went on crusade. And so she thinks he <coughs> interviewed them as they came back to St. of Rule. And he had contacts with them. He also had library sources. He drew on William of Poitiers. He drew on William of Jumiege. And so he also used books as sources. Um, some lost works we've been able to identify through reading his book. Okay. But primarily, it's a family history of Norman families. And the one, the most extraordinary thing to me about this book is, well, it's not extraordinary when you think about it. Now, let me see if you can see why. But only one manuscript survives of this great historical work. And it's the autograph manuscript. It's the one Orderic wrote himself. And that's the only one that survives. Uh, where is it located now? I think it's in, uh, I'm not sure where it is, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, probably, uh, when the monasteries were broken up after the French Revolution. It, it is. It's, uh, I'll see if I can find where the manuscript is. She? Now, is this when they still yeah. wrote the manuscripts? No, no, they were written or as books. Now. They were written as books. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Well, I'll see if I can look that up during the break. We don't have time right now. But um, there's only one manuscript, and it's the autograph manuscript. And, um, and that says to me that not very many people read it. Because, it. because when something was read very widely, there are hundreds of manuscripts uh, scattered all over Europe. And if there's only one, that means that not very many people read it. So that's kind of interesting, too. Absolutely, it does. It compares very well with beads, and bead could easily have been one of the models for it. The difference is that there are hundreds of manuscripts of bead and not of Orderic Vitalis. And I would guess that bead did inspire him. Um, and that uh, because the church was very, uh, there were copies of bead in all the Norman man, uh, monasteries, and so they knew about him. Yeah. Question. Well, that is very strange because I mean you've been going on along about how important history has been for the Normans, mm -hmm. and where this is a history of Norman families, it is unusual <coughs> that it wouldn't have been widely read, unless of course he never released it to anyone but himself. Well, there's no question of really. I, my opinion is, and it's only an opinion, <laughs> is that it's so massive, you know, that that you you it would take a lifetime to copy it, and so you couldn't really copy it enough to send it around to all these places. It's just too big, but it is a national treasure of France. It's so extraordinary. According to the Norman version of the story of the conquest of England, the story really begins with the marriage of Emma, who we talked about, the sister of Duke Richard II and the daughter of Duke Richard I, her marriage to King Ethelred Unred of England. And she had three children, uh, Alfred, Edward, and Godgifu, or Goda. I, I tend to call her Goda, although Marjorie, uh, although Elizabeth Van Hoots 
usually calls her Gargifu and she spells it differently. All of these names are spelled in lots of different ways, okay? There's no standard spelling of them. So you have to cross check. You might think you have two people when you only have one, okay? Now, Goda married Drew, Count of the Vexan in Normandy. And then secondly, she married Eustace, Count of Boulogne. Okay, and we'll see how that fits in. In 1033, Duke Robert sent a fleet to restore Edward to England. And he tried to put England, to, tried to put Edward back on the throne because Edward was his nephew. Canute, at that point, was king of England and offered to restore half of England. And here is Emma, who um, married Ethelred, and here she's receiving a letter. And here she's crossing the sea to go to England in an English boat. Well, Edward then started witnessing documents in, um, in Normandy as king of the English at Mont Saint-Michel is the first place he, he witnesses a document. And then only two years later, Canute died and Alfred sailed to England, but he was killed treacherously on his arrival. And the Normans uniformly, in every single one of these histories, the Normans blame Godwin, Earl Godwin of Wessex. And they blame him that he uh, treacherously and deceitfully promised to protect Alfred, and instead he murdered him. Edward had been poised to sail to England with a fleet at that moment in 1035, but when he heard that his brother had been murdered, he turned back and he decided he didn't have enough troops to defeat the English. So instead, we had the accession of Harold Harefoot, uh, who, was, uh, who was the son of um, Canute by Alfgafu, his Norwegian wife, and so he ruled for about five years, and then he died mysteriously. Lots of mysterious deaths at this point, and we know none of the details about how or why they died. And then, and they're young, they're young guys. Hartha Canute then uh, be, uh, left Norway. He had been king of Norway, and he came and became king of England in 1040 to 1042. And he also died a mysterious death at a very young age. At this point, Emma and Earl Godwin joined forces to install Edward as king. And they had worked together to really bring Hartha Canute there. And in fact, before they um, installed uh, before Hartha Canute died, they had persuaded him to make Edward a co-king, co-rulers of the kingdom and split the kingdom up between the two of them. So that when Hartha Canute died, uh, there still were a lot of claimants to the English throne, but Emma and Godwin were able to get Edward in there as king. They persuaded the Witan, they persuaded the archbishops of Canterbury and York, and Edward was crowned king in 1043. And here is Edward sitting on the throne of England as the king, and here he is as king. This is a famous picture of him. Here are these borders, by the way, that I was telling you about that have these interesting um, interesting clues to what's going on. The crucial year, as we said last time, was 1051. And you know, often when modern historians try to piece together the true story of the Norman Conquest, they try to take the different English accounts and the different Norman's accounts and somehow weave them together into the one true story. You can't do it. <laughs> You can't do it. It's really hard to do it. I mean, because we don't know what the truth is. But it's very clear in looking at all the sources that 1051 was a crucial year. And I'll just give you my interpretation of what happened. And this would be, um, I think, from the Norman perspective as well. Edward, uh, Edward banished the Godwins from England and uh, they had been sent out on sort of trumped up charges. And this is the point where the Norman sources claim that Edward promised England to Duke William. The Godwins, um, Edward was almost a prisoner of the Godwins uh, and, and uh, the Norman sources don't show him that way, but I think he was. 
Uh, he had a few Normans with him in England, and at this point he made Robert of Jumiege uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Robert of Jumiege had been the Bishop of London, and at this point this important marriage was made between Eustace, Count of Boulogne, and Goda, the sister of uh, uh, Edward the Confessor. In that very same year, William married Matilda of Flanders, and that was a smart move because then the Counts of Flanders would be his allies and this argues for the truth of this matter that Edward had named William as his heir and William was now preparing to um, uh, fortify himself with allies in Flanders by marrying the daughter of the Count of Flanders. But now the church throws a monkey wrench into it. <laughs> Just at that point in 1051 there was a new pope in Rome, and this new pope was Leo IX, and he is known as the first moderate reform pope. He placed Normandy under interdict, but Lanfranc of Beck, who we mentioned before, just happened to be in Rome at that time, allying himself with the reform papacy. And this was to have an enormous impact on Normandy because it probably was Lanfranc who told Leo IX that there were some questionable kinship ties between William and, uh, and uh, Matilda. In fact, she was the stepdaughter of one of his aunts, okay? And if you track that down, there was really not a consanguineous tie between them, a tie of blood. But if you didn't know the lineage perfectly, you would think there was because her father had been married to William's aunt at one time, even though she was the daughter of a different wife of of the Count of Flanders, Baldwin the, the, of Flanders. So I think it was a mistake that Lanfranc made. Nevertheless, it uh, had a huge impact on the church because interdict means that you can't have any church services in Normandy. And so this had an impact. The following year, the Godwins returned uh, to Normandy, to, to England, and what they did was come back with an army. And they had an army. They actually uh, uh, invested all the sea towns, the, the coastal towns of England. And uh, Edward the Confessor knew that he was beaten without a battle. I mean, he didn't even bother to fight because clearly they had the upper hand. And so the Godwins then came back and took over everything. Archbishop Robert was banished to Normandy, and the Normans uh, claimed in, instead, from their point of view, they claimed that Edward sent him to Normandy to tell William that William was going to be the heir to England. Okay, so they, they twisted the facts in the stories. Um, but it looks to me like what's happening in England is the Godwins come in with, a, with an iron fist and they've got Edward where they want him and they make him do what they want. Um, when Archbishop Robert was banished to Normandy, uh, this meant that there was no Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, because the rule of the church is, if you're an Archbishop, you're Archbishop for life. You can never be deposed. You can never step down. You're Archbishop for life. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the English church, the most important churchman in England. Now, they banished him and sent him to England, and then the Godwins put their own man in as archbishop. This would be Stigand, a Viking, who was consecrated archbishop of Canterbury. Now, what do you think the church is going to say about that, especially Leo IX in Rome? What's the opinion going to be? This is illegal. Stigand is not really the archbishop of Canterbury. He's making a false claim. He is a falsifier. And this is a heinous crime. 
the Normans claim that this is illegal and they make a big deal of this religious causation that here are these horrible Anglo-Saxons who don't even know how the Reformed Church works and they've got an illegal archbishop as the head of the English Church. Clearly, blasphemy is going on in England and this is anti-Christian, they're not any good. So this is the Norman propaganda about Stigand. Now, Lanfranc of Beck uses this political situation, and he was a master politician. He used the political situation. Now, William was kind of desperate. He had already married Matilda in 1051, and he wanted her as his, I mean, she was his wife. She, he had legally married her. And so how was he going to square things with the church? Well, Lanfranc came in and said, okay, you have done something wrong, which is to marry without the permission of the church, and so your penance will be that you will build two huge and very rich ducal monasteries and endow them with, with tons of wealth, and you will build them in, um, in the new city of Caen, one for men and one for women. And once you do this penance, then the Pope will forgive you and allow you to be married. Okay, so William built, began to build the twin abbeys at Caen, and they were actually completed in 1063. Uh, the two abbeys are La Trinité for women and Saint Etienne for men. And then Lanfranc became the abbot of Saint Etienne. He had not been abbot of Beck, he was prior of Beck. And here are these abbeys, here are drawings of them. This is La Trinité for women, and actually one of William the Conqueror's um, daughters became the abbess of La Trinité. And here is Saint Etienne, uh, the abbey for men, and Lanfranc became the, um, the abbot. And this is the first monumental architecture built in Normandy. It's, these are magnificent churches, very huge. Okay, now we're going to look at the bio tapestry and we only have 10 minutes, so we're not going to get through with the whole thing, but we're going to have a look at it and get as far as we can and we'll continue after the break. Okay, the first things I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a map of England under Edward the Confessor and then the story of the bio tapestry as it progresses and tell the, tells the story. According to the Norman version, in 1063, King Edward sent Earl, Her uh, sent Earl Harold Godwinson to inform William that William will succeed to the throne of England. Harold started out for the coast, preceded by his pack of hounds, and then we have a picture of Harold going on board, but winds force his ships aground on land belonging to Count Guy of Pontho. Okay, so here we have the map of England showing actually um, Godwin at this time is Earl of Essex and also of Kent and of Mercia, so he's a very powerful Earl in England. And here is Edward sending Harold to Normandy, and here is Harold setting out to go to Normandy to tell, uh, to tell William, doesn't that sound suspicious? To tell William that he's going to be the heir. And here's Harold and his men going to Bosham with their hounds, and then they're going to get in their ship and sail to Pontho. Now remember where Pontho is? It is um, right here in this area, right in here. Okay, and so he was. He went to Bosham, he's blown off course, and he lands in Pontho. When he gets to Pontho, which is not in Normandy, the Count of Pontho takes him captive. And here's our map of Pontho right over here. Uh, okay, let me go back. There is Pontho, Guy of Pontho, okay. Is the Count of Pontho. No, it's not in Brittany. Flanders. It's in Flanders, yeah. Not quite in Flanders. It's, it's between Normandy and Flanders. Frisia. It's in the disputed territory. Frisia is where it is. Yeah. Okay, so here he is. Now, then in the next scene, the English are landing, 
and the Count of Pontho takes Harold prisoner because he's not a Norman, so he takes, and, and, and so he's going to hold him for ransom, because this is how battles are really fought in Normandy at this time and in, in Europe, uh, that you don't, you don't want to kill somebody, you want to hold him for ransom and, and get money. Okay, informed of Harold's predicament, William sends messengers to Guy with orders to release Harold, and with their hair flying in the wind, two armored horsemen hurry to Beaurain in Ponceau. Harold is set free, and Guy hands him over to William and his men. So here is Guy of Pontho riding to take Harold to William. And notice the little marginal marginalia. We've got hunting dogs to remind us of the dogs that that um, uh, um, Harold had brought with him. Okay. Uh, and here is Guy of Pontho delivering Harold to Duke William. Okay, he's pointing to Harold. Here he is, you can have him, and here's Duke William. All right. Then, then they go to William's palace, and there are negotiations between William and Harold. Uh, then Harold goes on an adventure with Duke William, and they go to um, the other side of Normandy, and they, go, uh, they cross uh, they go to Mont Saint Michel, and then they go to the city of Dole in Brittany, and they attack the city of Dole and conquer it. The Mor Norman army marches into Dole, and Duke Conan is forced to flee. Duke Conan of Brittany surrenders and hands over the keys of the city on the tip of his lance. Okay, and here is Duke William receiving Harold at his palace and taking him as as a comrade in arms and then they're going to go off on an adventure. And here they are after they've captured Goal, Dole, and here's the city of Dole, or the castle of Dole on top of a mound, and their battle is going on, and Conan is giving the keys to the city to Duke William. All right, then they go back to William's headquarters, and William knights Harold. Touching two reliquaries, Harold then swears fealty to William. He does homage and fealty. And, and homage and fealty are um, the ceremonies by which a man becomes uh, the vassal of a lord in the feudal system. And Harold swears, okay? Harold then goes back to, to England and reports to Harold on his mission to Normandy. Then, right after that, um, uh, Edward dies, and, and we see him dying in the tapestry. His corpse is carried to St. Peter's Church after he's dead, but then there's a flashback, and we see Edward on his deathbed where he is promising uh, to herald the kingdom of England. And, and when you read that really carefully, that story is told in the life of King Edward. And what it says is, if you read it carefully, it says that um, William is giving the kingdom to his wife, Edith, and that Harold is supposed to be the caretaker of Edith. And so he seems to be interpreting, or that's a Norman version too, because Edith wrote the life of King Edward. She had it written under the Normans. So that's really a Norman twist to what was happening. Anyway, on his deathbed, Harold claims that Edward gave him the kingdom. And then he goes out and he, and he is crowned, uh, he is voted and acclaimed king by the Witan, and the two primates of England proclaim him king, according to the English version. According to the Norman version, he is a false king, he is a breaker of his oaths, he has broken all, of, all his oaths of fealty, he has broken his solemn promise to God that he will recognize William as the, uh, as the conqueror, as, as the heir to the English throne. So he is guilty of perjury and he must die. He's broken his oath to God. And so that's the Norman justification. Here is William um, 
uh, coming with arms to the castle of Dole. And here is the swearing on the relics. Notice there are two stacks of relics, one for each hand, so that we can be really sure uh, in, in the tapestry that he's swearing on the, uh, to God on the relics that he is swearing homage to Duke William. Here, Harold makes the sacrament. Here, Harold swears fealty to Duke William. Okay, and now here is the flashback to Edward's funeral. Okay, so we've gotten just to the point where Edward has died. Uh, the next uh, scenes in the story are going to be uh, William, uh, Harold taking, seizing the throne. According to the Norman version, he seizes the throne and then William uh, gets his act in gear and he gets everything ready for the invasion of England. So we'll have our break for about 15 minutes, and when we come back, we'll continue the story of William going across the channel and conquering England. <laughs> 